What are the sources of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ? Who can tell me the number one source of seerah of the Prophet ﷺ? The most? The Qur'an. The hadith is number two. The Qur'an. The number one source is Qur'an. And this is a source that is overlooked by many of the people. It is overlooked by many of the people. Immediately jump to, is it Ibn Ishaq? Is it Ibn Hisham? Is it this? The number one source of seerah is the Qur'an. Because the Qur'an was revealed during the seerah, so it's catering to situations that arose during the seerah. And the Qur'an references almost every single major incident in the life of the Prophet wasallam. In fact, even before his time, such as for example, Alam nashrah alaka sadrak. The, the reference here is to when he was five years old. When the Jibreel came and visited him. Alam nashrah alaka sadrak wa anka wizrak alladhi anqada dharak. So the seerah references every single major story in the life of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, And even before, is there any story mentioned even before he was born? Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al fil. The ashab al fil was before the Prophet was born. And Allah mentions it in the Quran, ashab al fil. So the seerah tells us stories from the beginning all the way up until the end. Al yawma akbaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al islam deena. One of the last verses revealed the completion of the benefits of the Quran. The Qur'an is the best source of seerah for many reasons. For many reasons. First and foremost is the speech of Allah. So Allah is telling this to us. So can we doubt the speech of Allah? And the eloquence of the Qur'an is something that is unparalleled. The eloquence is simply unparalleled. How beautifully Allah describes Badr and Uhud. How beautifully Allah describes the feelings of the Sahaba and the Munafiqun even. So another benefit of the Qur'an, any historian will record the outward. The Qur'an records the inward. The Qur'an tells us that, Right? The Qur'an tells us that you were terrified that day, that your throats were, your hearts were in your throats. The Qur'an tells us you became cowards. The Qur'an tells the Munafiqun, you are scared that Allah will expose you. Who can expose the hearts of the people other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the Qur'an is an amazing source of seerah. The eloquence, the power, the beauty, and ilm al-ghayb. The Qur'an explains to us phenomena we would not have understand. Right? Badr. Allah says in the Qur'an, we will reveal thalathati alafim min malaika munzaleen. We sent down 3,000 angels. Don't worry, we're going to help you. Uhud. Allah explained the, the, the disaster and catastrophe. Hudaybiyyah, inna fatahala laka fatham mubina. On and on. Every single incident. The Quran tells us ilm al ghayb. And there is no source of finding this out other than the Quran. However, one of the issues, we never say problems, one of the issues of the Quran is that, of course, it's not chronological, right? So we don't know the reference of the Quran simply because Baqarah, Ali Imran, Nisa, Ma'idah are not arranged chronologically. Right? They're arranged according to how the Prophet want them to be arranged. So Baqarah is an early Madani surah, it comes first. And Iqra, which is the first surah, is the 96th in the Quran. So it's not arranged chronologically. And another problem is that a lot of times you don't see the reference mentioned. So Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't mention the word Uhud. We need to know that Ali Imran was revealed for Uhud. That Anfal was revealed for Badr. We need to know this. And it's without, so the seerah and the Qur'an go hand in hand. In that you need the seerah to understand the Qur'an, you need the Qur'an to understand the seerah. So the two go hand in hand. So this is the first source, and it is the most prized source, it is the most eloquent source, and so on and so forth. The second source of seerah, as our sister pointed out, is hadith. And in fact, every hadith is one snapshot of the seerah, is it not? What is a hadith? It's a saying of the Prophet ﷺ. And what is the saying of the Prophet ﷺ except one incident? And so in one sense, every single hadith is a snapshot of the seerah. 
But of course, when we mean hadith, we primarily mean those that describe some incidents. Somebody came, somebody did, this happened. And so from the hadith, and there are lots of books of hadith, lots of books, and the most famous ones, as you should know, are six of them. They are called the six famous books, Al-Qutub al-Sitta. Uh, somebody called them, as, some call them As-Sihah al-Sitta, but that is not precise because they're not all Sahih. But the Kutub is Sitta, these are the primary books, but there are lots of other books of hadith. There are dozens of other books of hadith. The third source of seerah is books written specifically for seerah. And the first people to begin writing books of seerah were the sons of the Sahaba, the Sahaba's children. Can you imagine if your father was a Sahabi and he's telling you all of these stories of the Prophet ﷺ and there's so many, you begin to write them down. And of the greatest of those who wrote was Urwa, the son of Az-Zubayr. Urwa, the son of Az-Zubayr. Urwa is the son of the Sahabi, the grandson of the Sahabi. His mother is a Sahabiya. His grandmother is a Sahabiya. His brother is a Sahabi. But he was born after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. So he's not a Sahabi. His brother is even a Sahabi, but he's not a Sahabi. And his aunt is Aisha. His aunt is Aisha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. So Urwa is one of the primary narrators of hadith and fiqh and tafsir and of seerah. Because he has access to Aisha. Nobody had access to Aisha. He has, he's a mahram. Aisha doesn't need to wear hijab in front of him. So Urwa is the primary narrator from Aisha. And lots of... Details of the Prophet ﷺ come from Urwa because Aisha tells him those details. And it is said that Urwa wrote a small pamphlet of the seerah. Also, the son of Uthman ibn Affan, his name was Abban. Abban ibn Uthman ibn Affan. The son of Uthman ibn Affan, he died 105 Hijra. He also wrote a little booklet of seerah. And some other booklets were written until finally a great scholar came by the name of Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri. Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, who died 129 Hijra, And he wrote one of the first early treatises of Sirah. Now none of these books has existed, none of them anymore. We simply have references in later books of these earlier books. Why aren't they existent? Very, easy, very simple reason. When later books came, they absorbed the earlier treatises. So Abban is saying, my father told me, my father told me, my father told me. Urwa is saying, Aisha narrated, my father narrated, my uncle narrated. Three, four people. Imagine somebody comes and he takes Abban and Urwa and other books, and then he says, let me make a bigger book. Once the bigger book is written, who needs Urwa and who needs Abban anymore, right? You might as well copy that book. And realize in those days, there were no printing presses. In those days, if you wanted a book, what would you do? You would sit there and write it yourself cover to cover. So if you had to choose one book, you would choose the bigger ones. You would choose the ones with more details. And so it's a sad case for us now. We wish we had those early books, but unfortunately we don't have them. But we do have books that were written in the very next generation. Very early. And this shows us that seerah was compiled by and large even before hadith. By and large. Because they wanted to emphasize seerah more than anything else. And... The greatest, I'm being very simplistic here because obviously we can go, well, there's lots of PhDs written about sources of seerah. I'm summarizing in a short sentences. The greatest scholar of seerah is a name most of you would have heard of, Ibn Ishaq. Seerat Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq, his name is Muhammad Ibn Ishaq and he was born around 85 Hijra. Now think about it, 85 Hijra. Which means he's living in Medina, he's born in Medina. Right? This is where the Prophet ﷺ lived and died. This is where the children of the Sahaba are. He grew up around the children of the Sahaba and the grandchildren of the Sahaba. 85 Hijra is very early, right? And the Sahaba lived up until around 100, 110 Hijra. You know, Jab and others, they died 90 Hijra. So, it, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, or ibn Ishaq for short, he met the sons of the Sahaba. Maybe even he saw some of the Sahaba, maybe. But it's very early. 85 Hijra is when he's born, is very early. And he began writing everything that he heard. And he just had a passion for the seerah. So he began writing everything and began compiling it in chronological order. Unlike the earlier treatises, they weren't in chronological order. Ibn Ishaq began saying, well this happened in early Makkah, and this middle Makkah, this late Makkah, then the Hijrah. And then he go, so he compiled a very large book. 
And just to be on the safe side, he even traveled to other cities where some of the Sahaba had went. Basra, Kufa. He went and traveled there to discover the stories of Ibn Mas'ud who traveled to Kufa. To, to the, the stories of uh, the Sahaba who had traveled to other places in the world. So he traveled to other lands as well. But his primary source was always in Medina. And one of the best things about Muhammad ibn Ishaq is he compiled everything with the chain of narrators. What is the chain of narrators called in Islam? Isnad. Isnad. Isnad is the chain of narrators. The chain of narrators is a uniquely Islamic phenomenon. It does not exist in any other religion or culture. It's a uniquely Islamic phenomenon. And the chain of narrators tells us where the story came from. Because in Islam, we always wanted to verify authenticity. We didn't just base our religion, our superstitions and fables. Who told you this? Who told you that? Who told him that? Who told him that? All the way back to the Prophet ﷺ. So we compile the narrators. Ibn Ishaq from so and so, from so and so, from so and so. Back to the son of Jabir, from Jabir, from the Prophet ﷺ. So we have a whole isnad. And we know every person, when he was born, when he died, how, how good was he of a Muslim? Was he a good memory? Or was he a poor memory? And therefore we can judge the isnad. And so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, uh, Ibn Ishaq began compiling the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And he wrote a Massive book. It was so big, it was, they said it was in 10 15 volumes. And this is in, a, and he died, Ibn Ishaq died 150 Hijrah. So he lived from 85 to 150, very early on. It was so big that it was difficult to copy. And so one of his uh, students, if you like, came along, not a direct student, a student of a student, and his name was Ibn Hisham. These are two names most Muslims are aware of Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham. Right? And Ibn Hisham, his name was Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. And Ibn Hisham died 213 Hijrah. Now, the reason why I'm going into detail here is that the average Muslim should be aware of these two source books of the seerah Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham. Right? I know this is not directly the seerah, we'll get there, but you need to know some books. Where does the seerah come from? Primarily, the number one source is Ibn Ishaq and then Ibn Hisham. Now, what's the difference between Ibn Hisham and Ibn Ishaq? Very simple. Ibn Hisham realized that Ibn Ishaq is too big, 10, 12 volumes. So he decided to summarize it. Ibn Hisham did not add anything, he subtracted. He did not rearrange, he deleted. Ibn Hisham simply cut, 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 cut. Lots of cuts he made. And he made it into, now Ibn Hisham is available in four volumes. I have an edition, four volumes, let's say. So they say he made it maybe into a half or a third of the original size. Now somebody will say, why did he do that? Why didn't he leave it a large book? You need to realize in those days they didn't have printing press. If you wanted the book, you'd have to write it cover to cover. And he realized this was too much detail. And also one of the things of Ibn Ishaq, he was one of the first people to write a history of humanity. He began from Adam, he worked his way down, Ibrahim, uh, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, and then he made his way to the Prophet ﷺ. And Ibn, Ibn Hisham said, you know what, we don't need all of this, let's begin with the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ. So he deleted the entire section about early history. And he deleted a lot of other information that he felt was not that, uh, not that useful. And so over time, people began copying Ibn Hisham. And if you want to buy a copy of the book, you have to buy Sirat Ibn Hisham. You're not going to find Sirat. Which one? Ibn Ishaq. You're not going to find that. Okay, you're not going to find that because it is now gone missing. However, just a side point for the little bit more interested or enthused amongst you, there was a very, very famous scholar, Indian, <laughs> by the name of Dr. Hamidullah. Dr. Hamidullah. Very famous scholar. And he lived a very ripe old age, around 93. He just passed away five years ago, six years, no, actually a little bit, six, seven years ago. And he, he was from India, and then he went to France. And he became one of the greatest scholars uh, in what we call Orientalism, or, or you know, specializing, studying of Islam amongst non-Muslims. He wrote, book, uh, wrote books in French and in English, and he became a great researcher. And Dr. Hamidullah discovered many manuscripts. A lot of these manuscripts ended up in Berlin, in Paris, in London. Now how could ancient manuscripts end up over there? Many reasons, of them is colonialism. When the West came, and they started purchasing art items, and they started purchasing ancient things, they have the money, they have the political power. And so the sad fact of the matter is, some of the most earliest Qur'ans, we find them in Paris. The earliest Mus'haf that we have is in Paris. And another early Mus'haf is in London. 
and so on and so forth. So this is just the reality of the state of our ummah, that when they left, they took all of these treasures with them. Some of them were purchased, some of them were literally just taken by force. So after World War I, after all of this, there's a lot of manuscripts. Uh, and it's not just World War I. I mean, to be fair, a lot of them were purchased. So people, when you have pounds, sterling, or American dollars, people are willing to sell items, you know. And so, a lot of these items were purchased by rich businessmen who just valued it as art. So, lots of manuscripts. And to this day, by the way, the majority of early ancient manuscripts are found in, let's say, Germany. One of the most largest repositories of manuscripts are in Germany, because Germans had an interest in Islam in the 18th century. So, Hamidullah is obviously a Muslim, he reads fluent Arabic and whatnot. So he's going through all of these treasures in Germany, in Paris, in London, and he discovered a lot of manuscripts. One of the manuscripts he discovered was a partial copy of Ibn Ishaq. The Ummah had thought Ibn Ishaq is missing and gone. The Ummah had thought, khalas, there is no more Ibn Ishaq. He discovered around one-fourth of Ibn Ishaq. And so he edited it and published it. And when now we compare, this is why it's good to have the earlier sources. Because then we can show the people, look, Ibn, Ibn Hisham didn't just invent Sirah. He's taking it from Ibn Ishaq. So when he compared Ibn Ishaq with Ibn Hisham, he found that exactly as Ibn Hisham said, he simply cut off around half or around one third. He just cut off. What did he cut off? Long poetry, uh, the lineage of the Arabs. So every time Ibn Ishaq would mention a name, he'd take him back to, let's say, Nuh alayhi salam. Okay? Lineage of 50, 60 people. So Ibn Hisham goes, look, you know what, let's just go back four or five people, cut the rest off. So when he compared the two, he found, yes, Ibn Hisham was accurate in what he did. And therefore, we can now say, alhamdulillah, for sure, when we read Ibn Hisham, we're reading something written around a hundred years after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Amazing, wallah, it's amazing. Far before any book of hadith. Because Bukhari died 256, Muslim died uh, 261, and so on and so forth. So Ibn, Ibn uh, Ishaq died 150, he wrote the book around 130 or so. So literally around a hundred years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, a little bit more than a hundred, we have the majority or the bulk of Ibn Ishaq preserved through Ibn uh, Hisham. So, uh, the third source of seerah is the books specifically written for the seerah. The fourth source of, the, of seerah are the books written about the characteristics of the Prophet wasallam. In Arabic, the word is shama'il. shama'il. A number of early authors, they wanted to describe the Prophet and they wrote books about his description. Of course, the most famous, you all know this book. What is the most famous shama'il? Shama'il? Tirmidhi, Shama'il al-Tirmidhi. This is the most famous Shama'il, Shama'il of Tirmidhi. Uh, but there were many Shama'il written. And Shama'il is a genre of books that deals with the looks, the characteristics, the manners, the possessions, the houses of the Prophet. It's called Shama'il, specialities. Another source of Sirah are the books written about the miracles of the Prophet in Arabic called Dala'il. There's another genre of books, Dala'il. And there are many books of miracles written. So by looking at the miracles, you can extract seerah. Now, the most famous book of Dala'il is called Dala'il al-Nubuwa of al-Bayhaqi. And this is around in 12 volumes. It's a massive book encyclopedia. This is Dala'il al-Nubuwa of al-Bayhaqi. And then there are other sources of seerah. There's histories of the Sahaba. So people recorded the histories of the Sahaba. By studying the histories of the Sahaba, you extract seerah. And then finally, we'll mention the histories of Makkah and Medina. People wrote Tariq Makkah. And Tariq Medina. And so by reading the Tariqs of Makkah and Medina, we extract Sirah. And so these are the primary sources of uh, Sirah. To this, modern people have added uh, sources that were not found in Muslim lands. And this is very difficult and rare, but there's a new genre of research in academia and in Islamic studies here in America and the Western world. What did the Romans say about the Arabs at the time? What did the Persians say? What did the other civilizations say? And what, what stories did those Arabs tell the Romans? And this is recorded bits and pieces. Uh, and this is another complicated topic, but um, uh, this is not the time and place to get into that. But some of the sources that now we have access to, earlier scholars did not have access to.